Build Show today, we are talking heat pump water heaters. I got my master plumber buddy, Eric Ani. We're gonna give you the 101, how these work, also how they've changed over the last 15 years. And we're gonna ask Eric from his perspective, you know, when you think about these from a plumbing perspective, what do you look for in a good unit? Because none of these are bad units, right? But there's some things that are different and potentially better about some of these units. So with that being said, heat pump water heaters 101, let's get going. Okay, Eric, first, with these have been on the market since 2010. I think you and I both put uh, a ream unit in around 2010. I remember yeah. putting that in a remodel. So this is a relatively mature technology, but in the scheme of things, it really hasn't been that long they've been on the market. Think about refrigerators in American houses since the 1950s. This is only since 2010. So a lot's changed in the 15 years on these. But help us to understand, like, when you think of a heat pump water heater, how do you explain it to a customer? I kind of explained like, hey, we have all this energy in the air and just like your refrigerator, the refrigerator is taking the energy inside the box, trying to expel it out into the air. That's what's happening. You've yep. had a heat pump in your house all along. That's right. Whether you knew it or not. Or, or I guess, and then the water heater is saying, well, we've got all this energy in the air that your refrigerator is expelling. Right. <laughs> Let's put it into the water. Exactly. Pretty it's basic. just taking ambient heat and dumping it into the tank. Yeah. And it does it very, very efficiently. Uh, in terms of moving energy around these days, close to a four to one ratio. You know, if you think about a, a hair dryer that makes heat, it's 100% efficient, right? It, con it converts perfectly that electricity to heat with a resistance coil, but a heat pump is moving that heat four times more efficiently. It's, it kind of blows your mind a little bit. Now there's a bunch of different ways to power these. Some of these are 110 models, mm -hmm. some are 220, 240. 221, whatever it takes. <laughs> but the same idea works on all of these, that there's a compressor on the top, you know, starting with the like R2D2 unit looking Bradford White. The compressor's on the top. They all have a tank on the bottom and it's moving that heat from the ambient air into the tank. I think something that people need to know, whether it's a builder or somebody's thinking about replacing, you gotta have enough ambient air for one of these units. You can't shove this into a small closet. It will not work correctly. Any, that, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that and I'm gonna try to abbreviate it because I tell you what, that's our biggest challenge. Number one, if these are gonna operate successfully, mm -hmm. people are gonna be happy with their performance, we need to put them in a space where we're giving them a chance. Yep. Every one of these is gonna have a manual that says they need at least 700 to 750 cubic feet of space right. that, where they're installed. If you don't have that, then you need to bring air from somewhere else and you need to exhaust the air coming off of these because that's what's truly happening. They're taking that air in from the atmosphere or wherever you're gonna duct it from. Yep. And then they're gonna cool that air down. They're gonna pull out a whole bunch of humidity from it if it's there. Mm -hmm. And then it's gonna expel it into the space that they're, op they're sitting in. Let me break that down real quick because you said that quickly and builders may have done the math, but somebody who's not a builder, 750 cubic feet if you think about a room that's like a 10 by 10 room with an eight foot ceiling, that's 10 by 10 is 100 times an eight foot ceiling. That's 800 cubic feet of space. It's not a very big room. And if you have one of these operating in that room with a closed door and no vent into that room, that room's gonna get cold quick and this unit is not gonna be very efficient. So your better placement for one of these units would be like an entire basement space, an entire garage space. Anywhere that it's frankly hot is a great space for this. So if you're in the south, you know, if you have a hot uninsulated garage, that's a fantastic place to put one of these units. Plenty of outside ambient heat to get into that tank. A lot of old farmhouses, leaky basements, things like that can make for a great atmosphere for one of these. Yep. It's not limited to that space, like that's I right. said, because we can duct these. We talk about just different interfaces here. Yeah, the AO Smith is probably the most intuitive to understand what the ducting is. If you look at the top of this unit, you've got uh, one that's labeled uh, intake and one that's labeled exhaust. Yep. And you can tell like, oh, I could fit a duct on that. So if this had to go in a closet, you could duct out of that closet and into that closet to bring air from let's say a room next door, or if there was a closet in the garage, you could bring the garage air in take the heat out and then exhaust that cold air out. Some of these other models aren't as easy to understand how they could duct. 
And I don't know about these two, but I do believe that this one has a duct kit, correct? Yeah, so like this Bradford White model, the AO Smith, they have a, a, a kit you can buy. And what that kit is, is literally an adapter right. to mount to the tank, which is gonna allow you then to connect your ducting. It's not a whole ducting kit in that sense. So it's gonna be an adapter. If you need to install it on a unit like this though, this I think worth pointing out, mm -hmm. uh, it has to go on the side. So it's gonna add some additional space. It's gonna add space now so that we need a little bit more room to install this. If this were going into a closet and there were appliances on both sides of it or a wall or whichever, it might not be doable. May not have the space for that. Right, That's right. exactly. Uh, another point that's interesting about these, Eric, and I'm curious from your perspective, if you look at these five in a row, there's different inlet ports on, uh, yeah. on these. I'm curious what your take is on that. So we got three of them here with top connections. Uh, I will just say, like, it, it, it might not be obvious, but the top connection for a retrofit application, which, of course, I'm dealing with all the time with, yeah. as a service plumber, uh, this is going to be easier to install top application because the tank I'm pulling out is going to have top, top, top uh, connections already, mm -hmm. right? Gotcha. So that makes it a little bit easier. The other thing, too, like the ducting, when we have side connections, which is also kind of common, there's a few other models that we're not showing here, they have side connections as well. Now we've got piping coming off the side of our tank, making it larger, needing a little, little more room and also access. Yep. Where before we just had to be on top makes of the sense. tank. Now one spec that I think is really important that I think about it a lot as a builder is how loud are these units? Uh, Gen 1, those ones that I installed in 2010, yeah. They were pretty noisy, weren't they? <laughs> they were, and it was funny, we were talking off camera, when did we install our first ones? I know for a fact my first one was uh, 2010, pretty much right when uh, they came out onto the market. Mm -hmm. uh, I was eager to put them in. I took out the first two that we put in because they were too loud. We got noise right? complaints from our customers. Now, however, that's not an issue. Yeah. It really isn't. These things may have varied degrees of decibel output mm -hmm. uh, that you can measure at each one of them. They're not gonna be identical, but they're very quiet by comparison. And the manufacturers actually disclose that, which is really cool. Like some of these models are under 50 decibels, which is really darn quiet. Generally yeah. speaking, under 60 is, is fine and adequate, and probably all of these models are today. They weren't that way in 2010. So that's something that's really changed. Just better design on the exhaust, air, things like that. And we have a few manufacturers not represented here. This is not a sponsored video, but like for instance, Ream, uh, they're on like generation five or six maybe right. now. Right. Uh, where some other manufacturers like Renai has a great unit. It's their very first entry in the marketplace, but you really like that unit. Yeah, I've installed a couple of them. It's super quiet, easy to install. It does have those side connections, but it has some neat features of hardware, like no plastic fittings, right? Oh, I like nice. that. As a plumber, when I look at a tank, I look at it, well, what, what are we connecting to? Mm -hmm. Everything is either stainless steel or solid brass, and that's important. Speaking of that, uh, I noticed, Eric, that all of these units in this lineup here, uh, although the LG, we're not quite sure, but all the others have a brass outlet at the bottom. And a lot of times when you go to the home center and see the retail versions, yeah. you see a plastic fitting there. And the first thing I think as a builder is like, plastic fittings, really? Isn't that gonna leak or be a problem? What do you think about that? They're At the very least, they're hard to deal with and it's gonna be a problem down the road, mm -hmm. right? I think a solid brass drain is just a no-brainer. There's not a lot to discuss there. Right. It's more durable than the plastic. We rely on plastic for a lot of things, but a drain on a tank like that, I need it to be a little more durable. Speaking of which, I'm curious, how often should people be draining their tanks, whether it's whether it's these or a standard gas unit? I feel like I'm gonna break the internet right now when I say this, <laughs> but you should be draining these out, flushing them, doing annual maintenance, annually, annual maintenance. every year. Every I say year. it comes out automatically yeah. out of my mouth. Every single year you are to flush and clean very simple procedure, your yep. tank water heaters. And it says that right in the manual. Now, speaking of annual maintenance, a big thing that I learned a few years ago that, that frankly surprised me was I always kind of thought water heaters were generally destined to die after about a decade. But in fact, it's the anode rod issue that tends to prematurely kill a water heater. Talk to us about what we need to know about anode rods. Well, an anode rod exists because we have a steel tank. Mm -hmm. These tanks are made out of steel, mostly uh, 
just carbon steel with yeah. some type of lining, like a painted on lining, like a glass lining. Yeah. Okay, so how that works is they build the tank out of steel, they spray this liquidified glass inside of it, they bake it in an oven, and that creates this protective coating. When we put water in that tank, and if that coating were ever to fail, we're gonna have corrosion, mm -hmm. right? Because steel just can't hold up against water forever. Yep. And we've got these, we've created basically a giant battery now, because our water's corrosive, our tank is gonna take the beating, and we have to give it some, we have to keep the corrosion off the tank, we put an anode rod in it. So it's, they all often call it a sacrificial rod. Yeah. Because that rod breaks down rather than the tank first. Yeah, most rods that are gonna be, or most anode rods shipped in a tank are gonna be just a real dumb piece of metal, typically magnesium, or a composite between aluminum and magnesium. Just kind of depends on what area of the country they're being shipped to because yep. of the water qualities. But those are usually installed through the top of the tank. They're roughly the height of the tank itself mm -hmm. and they start to deteriorate over time. So you said something there that's really interesting. They're usually installed at the top of the tank, but if you look at the top of these tanks, uh, these all have heat pumps in the way. None of these are easy to get to when it comes right. to the anode rod, are they? No, you do have to access the the anode rod from by removing the shroud around the heat pump, mm -hmm. and it's probably gonna be buried in there, and it's gonna be harder to get to than a traditional tank for sure. And if you read the manufacturer specs, at least on a couple of these I was reading through, they tell you that you should inspect that at least every three years. Yeah. And at a minimum, it needs to get replaced by year six. So what's happening is no one's maintaining their tanks. They're not flushing them. They're not checking the anode rods. That electrolysis is happening. And that's why a typical American is replacing their water heater within a decade because it, there's no maintenance done. Right. We don't need to do that. Uh, we can we can do the maintenance, we can check the anode rods, we can replace them. Uh, we can also use a totally different type of anode rod. So that big slug of metal, that big rod that's just hanging in the tank there, protecting mm -hmm. the tank itself, we can actually replace that with a, a smaller abbreviated version, it's actually electronic. Oh, a powered anode So rod. powered anode rods work really great, typically aftermarket. Some of these units actually have a powered anode rod. Two of these guys have a powered anode rod. Uh, that fact, was one of them has a powered and a non-powered anode. That was impressive to me to learn that. Yeah. I didn't know that these were starting to get shipped with powered anode rods. I'm a big fan of a power anode rod because it takes that guesswork out of it. We don't have to pull it out and check it. Mm -hmm. We're just assuming that the, the dumb anode rods, the non-powered versions are, fit, are going to need replaced eventually, yep. but we're not ge getting invited back into our customers' houses to do that work because yeah. they just don't understand That's right. it's important. Also, I wanna note, at least two of these have an anode sensor alert. Both the AO Smith and the GE model have some type of a, hey, you need to check this, or yep. maybe this is dying call your plumber and, and do it. I think if you don't learn anything from this video, you should learn that these units need an annual maintenance and every couple years they need more than just a regular in, uh, annual maintenance. They probably need an anode change. And if you do that, you can get a lot longer out of one of these tanks. It wouldn't be unusual to get 15 or even 20 years out of one of these guys. This top heat pump uh, technology is very, very reliable. Think about your refrigerator. You should have a refrigerator for two decades without any problems, no no big deal. Same was true with these. Yeah, the, there's not a lot going on. It's a basic piece of uh, equipment underneath there as far as the heat pump goes. Any last thoughts, anything I missed on this, Eric? I think one of the big important things we need to learn uh, when it comes to selecting the right water heater, especially tanks, is just sizing. Yep. So look at the manufacturer's info, Consider how it's gonna fit in your home, how many bathrooms you have, how many people. You don't wanna be undersized, but also oversizing a tank like this isn't gonna do you any favors. That is a great point. In fact, let me make a quick mention on that. The first hour rating on these are typically less than a gas unit, but if you look at some of the bigger tanks, like the 80 gallon tanks, they usually have a first hour rating of 80, maybe even 90 gallons. And I have an 80 gallon heat pump at my house uh, then I have a family of six and I have never run out of hot water. So if you get the bigger model, even if you have a bigger family, typically you're gonna be fine. Another tip that you might look for on the specs from a spec side is some of these can go to a hotter temperature than others. The one that I bought uh, can go up to 150 degrees. I don't need that, but if I did need it, I was, if I was running out of hot water, I could go out and change the dip switch setting on my unit to go up to a hotter temperature. So that's something to think about as well. Yeah. Yeah, we're starting to see them. They're gonna be 
uh, mandated for electrical resistance, water heating. Yep. Uh, this is what we're gonna have as an option as we move forward, as those codes start to become in, uh, enacted and then enforced. Yeah, and I think also we're seeing more and more people that are opting for all electric because they want to put solar, they want to put a battery on, they don't want to have to rely on uh, other sources of power. So, you know, when you think about a unit like this that can actually run on 120, this could replace your gas tank in the house uh, with an 80 gallon 120 powered unit. It's pretty crazy what they're able to accomplish these days with and these with, pump water heaters. Yeah, and every one of these could run off of uh, uh, the proper size solar PV array. Yeah because uh, the heat pumps themselves are typically running around 500 watts, which isn't the huge draw. Yeah, it's not huge. The 240 is when they're running the resistance rod in there. Almost all of these have a 240 model and several of them also have a 120 model. Guys, if you're not currently following Eric, you should absolutely go check him out at Mechanical Hub on Instagram. And he's been shooting videos for three years now on yeah. the build show. Yeah. So go check out his amazing work, including a video he just shot on a one on a water heater that's not here in this lineup called the Sanco CO2 powered. It's using carbon dioxide as the refrigerant and it's a split unit. That's actually the model I used at my house. And Eric has a terrific 30 minute video on the full install process on that unit. Go check that out on the buildshow.com. I'll put a link to that below. Also, I did a full review uh, on these water heaters that was sponsored by the EPA. So I'd love to have you check that out too. You can get all the nerdy specs on these exact models. But Eric, appreciate the time, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's close it out together. Guys, follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show. Build Show.